But with the fall of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the post-Soviet states uh, in the Balkans and other areas of Eastern Europe, uh, Slovakia in particular has developed quite a thriving trade in exporting um, endangered species that had been uh, eliminated in the more progressive areas of Western Europe, <laughs> but endured in backward Slovakia, like the European brown bear. Not only do they have an active tourist bear watching industry uh, in contemporary Slovakia, Slovakia, but they have exported the brown bear for uh, re-implantation in areas from which it had been removed in other, other places uh, around Europe, including the Basque areas of France and Spain. Uh, the French government is offering uh, farmers in the area a free livestock guardian dog okay, to repel the bears and to teach the uh, sort of uh, yuppie Slovakian brown bears the proper postmodern order of things in restoration <laughs> ecology <laughs> politics. But the problem is the insurance industry reimburses the farmers for any lost stock. So while the dogs can compete effectively with the brown bear, they are losing to the insurance industry. Uh, I don't know if that's I don't know what to do with that story, but that does seem to be the contemporary state of things. Meanwhile, those people who are trying to work with these dogs uh, in the French areas of the Basque are uh, collaborating over email with my white, uh, overweight, middle class, uh, with a little luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, the dogs are not allowed to intermingle much. Now, Australian, I'm going to have to say a little tiny bit about Australian shepherds in order to make the, the point of my talk. And it's going to have to take the form of telling you that Australian shepherds are one of the few true products of the United States. They have nothing to do with Australia uh, except the following. In the context of the gold rush, the uh, depressed sheep industry, the, the depressed sheep economies of California, depressed, as you know, the Spanish favored raising sheep as a way of, quote, civilizing, close quote, the Indians, and the uh, relative decline in the populations of California tribes and have gone hand in hand with the decline of the uh, numbers of sheep in California, so that by the 1840s, relative to the immediately preceding decades, uh, there were uh, relatively few sheep and few sheep herders around. Come the California gold rush, all of a sudden there are a lot of hungry, disappointed miners who would like a little mutton. Large numbers of sheep are shipped into California from around the Horn, up from New Mexico, over from Kansas, and from that nearby white settler colony, Australia, which had a large surplus of merino sheep that had come uh, from uh, Germany via a gift uh, to the King of Saxony, <laughs> who had developed then in turn a thriving colonial trade in sheep. Okay. These sheep come over on the ship, and the existing motley of English collies in California and uh, other areas of the western United States are enlisted uh, as herding dogs and come to be known as Australian sheep, almost certainly because of their association with the imported sheep. But the, uh, these, these herders are directly part of the uh, consolidation of the conquest of the U.S. West. Okay? The ranching economies of the U.S. West, uh, which uh, get a large injection in the gold rush and then finally uh, take the uh, form that we've come to recognize in the post-Civil War period, the, the um, final consolidation of conquest and expropriation and relocation of peoples. These dogs are directly part of the um, ranching technology that makes uh, this whole process of transformation of landscapes, grass, you know, the types of grass that grow on the land, the kinds of life ways that grow on the land, these systems of, of freedom and domination that grow on the land. Um, these dogs are directly part of that history. Now my point for telling this is to say that when I think when I touch Cayenne, when a person touches his or her dog, you touch, of course, the face-to-face -face being uh, with, with whom you're in a complex, multi-layered relationship uh, of difference, of play, of authority, of pain. You're in a complex face-to-face -face relationship of an irreducibly individual kind. You also inherit every single one of those layers of history. And any relationship which one takes seriously unwinds into the world. Any relationship of love taken seriously makes one more worldly. Now, I believe folks who associate with dogs um, who, are in the, who are in the legacy of the history of the pastoral economies, obviously similar stories can be told for other kinds of animals, other kinds of animal-human relationships. I believe that people such as Rustin and myself, who live with these dogs, inherit in a rather special way a responsibility for understanding what's going on in sovereignty claims in the U.S. West. 
for what's going on in restoration ecology, for the multi-species questions around bears and wolves and dogs and humans in their life ways. I think any relationship which one takes seriously brings with it its whole concatenation of legacies. And that when one asks, who are you? That is, the, that is the question that has many temporalities. It has the temporality of evolutionary history, it has the temporality of historical narrative, and it has the temporality of face-to-face -face love and hate. Uh, any relationship taken seriously enough unwinds into that kind of uh, complexity, which never resolves into universals, but one nonetheless ties one into a very large world. I'm not going to have time to tell the stories of the international adoption pipe pipeline in Mutz that brings dogs from the hard streets of Puerto Rico to the forever homes of northern Massachusetts, but I think just telling you what I'm not telling you will give you some of the <laughs> neo-colonial politics that I might otherwise have discussed. Uh, instead, I will turn immediately to a conclusion that says, I yearn much more for, for much more reflection in dogland about what it means to inherit the multi-species, relentlessly complex legacy that crosses evolutionary, personal, and historical timescales of companion species. Every registered breed, indeed every dog, is immersed in practices and stories that can and should tie dog people into myriad histories of living labor, class formations, gender and sexual elaborations, racial categories, and other layers of locals and globals. Most dogs on Earth are not members of institutionalized breeds. Village dogs and rural and urban feral dogs carry their own signifying otherness for the people they live among and not just for people like me. Nor are mutts and other so-called random bred dogs in the so-called developed world like the functional kinds of dogs that emerged in ecologies and economies that no longer flourish. Puerto Rican strays called setos become members of Massachusetts forever families out of histories of stunning complexity and consequence. In current nature cultures, breeds might be a necessary if deeply flawed means to continue the useful kinds of dogs they came from. Current U.S. ranchers have more to fear from real estate developers from San Francisco and Denver than from wolves, no matter how far they get from the parks, or from Native Americans, no matter how effective they get in the court. In my own personal historical nature culture, I know in my flesh that the largely middle class white people of Pier and Aussie land have an as yet unarticulated responsibility to participate in reimagining grasslands ecologies and ways of life that were blasted in significant part by the very ranching practices that required the work of these dogs. Through their dogs, people like me are tied to indigenous sovereignty rights, ranching, economic and ecological survival, radical reform of the meat industrial complex, racial justice, the consequences of war and migration, and the institutions of technoculture. It's about, in Helen Veron's words, getting on together. When purebred cayenne, mixed breed Roland and I touch, we embody in the flesh the connections of the dogs and the people who made us possible. When I stroke my landmate Susan Caudill's sensuous Great Pyrenees willow, I also touch relocated Canadian gray wolves, upscale Slovakian bears, and international restoration ecology, as well as dog shows and multinational pastoral economies. Along with the whole dog, we need the whole legacy, which is, after all, what makes the whole companion species possible. Not so oddly, all these holes are non-Euclidean knots of partial connection. Inhabiting that legacy without the pose of innocence, we might hope for the creative grace of play. And so I end with a notice of a sports writer's daughter. <clears throat> with Kai and Willem playing with each other, which of course they shouldn't do as an Australian shepherd who works by predation and a livestock guardian dog who works by uh, inhibited predation and enhanced territoriality. Ms. Cayenne Pepper has shown her true species being at last. She's a female Klingon in heat. <laughs> you may not watch much television or be a fan of the Star Trek universe like I am, but I'll bet the news that Klingon females are formidable sexual beings whose tastes run to the ferocious as reached everyone in the Federated Planets. The peer on our land, the intact 20-month-old Willem, has been Cayenne's playmate since they were both puppies, beginning at about four months of age. Cayenne was spayed when she was six and a half months old. She's always happily humped her way down Willem's soft and inviting backside, starting at his head end with her nose pointed to his tail, while he lies on the ground trying to chew her leg or lick a, lick a rapidly passing genital area.